This morning we're looking at uh, Mark chapter 14. Our text is verses 3 through 9, the example of the woman who takes the precious perfume and pours it on the head of Jesus to anoint him for his upcoming death and burial. Let's read about that in Mark 14, beginning in verse 3 through verse 9. While he was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper and reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume of pure nard. And she broke the vial and poured it over his head. But some were indignant, remarking to one another, why has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. They were scolding her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you bother her? She has done a good deed to me. For you always have the poor with you. And whenever you wish, you can do good to them. But you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now again, as you know, we're in the final week of our Lord Jesus' earthly ministry. His life, of course, goes on, but we're talking about his life on earth just a few days away from the crucifixion. This morning we see Jesus in Bethany, and perhaps you've read the Gospels before, you know that uh, Bethany was close by to Jerusalem. Uh, I believe it's John who tells us it was only two miles away. And every evening after Jesus would finish ministering in Jerusalem, he would go to Bethany in order to uh, recline for the evening or to spend the night. And the reason why he did that was because he had several friends in that particular town. It's, it's interesting, isn't it, that um, we often think of Jesus as being so self-sufficient, you know, that he didn't really need anything, and yet he desired the comfort of friends, and that's what he was seeking during this time. Lazarus lived there, uh, Martha and Mary lived there, and of course this man named Simon, among others. Now, we do read that he was staying in the home of Simon the leper. Every time I read that, I think, you know, <laughs> who would want to be in a house with a leper? Well, we do need to realize that Simon was not a leper any longer, that Jesus had healed him. It's just that there's so many Simons in the Bible that the Simons are distinguished from one another by, you know, their relations or who they might be. I mean... Uh, there, I have a list here of all the Simons. There, Jesus had a half-brother named Simon. There's Simon Peter. There's one of his disciples whose name is Simon the Zealot. A Judas who betrayed him, his father's name was Simon. There was Simon the Pharisee and Simon of Cyrene who bore the cross of Christ. And actually, I don't think I found them all. So how do you distinguish all of these people? Well, you either talk about where they're from or their relations or what is it that's unique about them? Well, what was unique about this man was that he formerly was a leper, but the Lord had healed him. Now, while he was there, we read that a woman came with a, an alabaster vial of very costly perfume, and she broke that vial and poured it on his head. Again, that might make us cringe because we try to get things like that out of our hair, but in those days, these things were actually... Uh, desirable, even to pour oil on somebody's head to the point where it drips down their, their beard or their face, their beard, and onto their clothes and so forth. It was actually a sign of blessing. And we need to realize that what this woman did was a great sacrifice on her part. After all, this was very precious perfume. The disciples complain. This perfume could have been sold for 300 denarii, or de something like that, a denarii, which we know is a a day's wages. Basically, this, co this perfume cost as much as what a working man would earn in almost a year. This was very precious perfume. Apparently, the disciples thought it was also wasted, too great of a sacrifice, and they scolded her for it, telling her that that perfume should have been sold and given to the poor. We, we actually find in other parts of Scripture the one who complained the most was Judas, one of, of course, our Lord's disciples who was going to betray him 
he was the one who had charge of the money bag. And as often as he had opportunity, would reach his hand in there and pilfer the bag, steal from it. So he was probably thinking, if we had 300 in the area in there, I could really make a killing. But Jesus defended her. This was not a misuse of her resources. You have not injured the poor by doing this. Jesus says the poor, you're always going to have with you. You can minister to them anytime you want, but you cannot always minister to Jesus. He would not always be there, at least as we know bodily on earth. What she had done, Jesus said, she had done to anoint his body for burial. Now, you know, also, as we read on in the scriptures, we're going to see that the circumstances of Jesus' death were such that after he died on the cross, there would not be time to anoint him for burial. His death would be on the day of preparation, preparation of the Sabbath, so that they would not do that work on that day. There wouldn't be time. And you remember that when, by the time they get back to the tomb in order to complete that work, Jesus had already been raised from the dead, so there wasn't going to be time to anoint him. And the Lord had providentially provided that his body would be anointed for burial before his crucifixion and his death. So we might say the work was already done, and it was a done deal. Jesus was going to die, and this was further proof that that would be the case. So consequently, she had actually done a good thing. And so Jesus says that she would be rewarded for that act of kindness. Wherever the gospel is preached, he said, in the whole world, this act of kindness that she had done to him would also be mentioned in memory of her. Now, I don't think that Jesus meant by this that whenever the gospel is preached that this was going to be tacked on as sort of an addendum. By the way, this woman anointed Jesus. But what he meant was that this would be recorded in the Gospels, as we know that it is. And whenever God's people around the world from this time on read the Gospels, they will read about what this woman did for Jesus. By the way, we were reading it this morning, aren't we? So that's proof that what Jesus said is true. Jesus keeps his word. Now, the fact that Jesus was about to die for us is certainly looming in this passage, and we're going to be looking at that extensively over the next several Lord's Days as we look at the account of his, his betrayal and his sufferings and his death and his resurrection. But what I'd like for us to focus on this morning is the example of this woman to remind us that we are called upon to do the same thing that she did, although we don't do it exactly the same way, of course, but to minister to our Lord Jesus Christ. I think you already know from the other passages we read how we can do that. So I want us to consider three things from this passage, from this example Jesus commends to us. First of all, that you can, in fact, still minister to Jesus even though Jesus is in heaven and we're on earth. Secondly, and this, this is going to require just a bit of explanation, so kind of, you know, if, if this sounds offensive, uh, don't take it that way. We're going to see what it means. Ministering to him is more important than ministering to those outside of his body. And then finally, that Jesus promises to reward you if you will minister to him. So first of all, let's consider that you can still minister to Jesus Christ. Now, you know as well as I do that we can't do it as directly as the woman did. Jesus is not seated with us in this congregation. There is no place on earth we can go to. As a matter of fact, uh, there's really never going to be a place on this earth that we can go to to minister to Jesus one day. When the new heavens and new earth come, then perhaps we can't. He died. He rose again. He ascended into heaven. He's seated at the right hand of heaven. He's ruling and reigning. Jesus told his disciples, you do not always have me. So he's not here, at least physically. But does that mean that you can't minister to him? Now, Jesus, as we've already seen, tells you that you can by ministering to his people. Now, we've already read Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46 that give us the Sheep and goat judgment. It tells us a couple of things. One I didn't mention yet. He tells us that this is going to happen. 
one day we are going to stand before the Lord. That is as true as what Jesus said to the woman, wherever the gospel is preached, what you have done for me will be mentioned. It's mentioned. It's going to happen. The sheep and goat judgment is going to take place. So the first thing we need to do is make sure we're ready for that judgment. Of course, the way that we can be is by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ and turning from our sins and doing what it is it also tells us to do. Because again, note what it is we're actually going to be judged for on that day. What is the evidence that Jesus is going to be looking for to show that we are in fact true believers? Well, it boils down to this. How we treated our brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ when they were in need. And you know that he actually says more than this. He says how we treated them in their need is how we will have treated him. He said to his sheep in Matthew 25, verse 40, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. And of course, to the goats in verse 45, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Now, I don't know how many times you've heard this passage preached again and applied to everyone in the world. You know, you've got to meet every need that you see. You've got to minister to those outside the church. Now, it is true that we do. I'm not saying we don't, but that's not what Jesus is talking about here. He is talking about how you minister to one another. Whatever you do to a brother or sister in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are doing to him. Now, this means, among other things, that you can minister to Jesus Christ by ministering to his people. Whatever you do for one another, you are, in a sense, doing for him. You can feed Jesus when he's hungry. I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. You can give Jesus something to drink when he's thirsty. You can cover him if he is in need of covering. If he's sick or in prison, you can visit him and you can comfort him. There's also a sense in which you can minister to him in other ways. I mean, the Lord has given to us other gifts, spiritual gifts, to minister to one another. So you can minister to Jesus in the same way in a spiritual sense. You can build him up with your gifts. You can encourage him. This sounds really strange. You can help him to glorify God. <laughs> But of course, we do that by helping his body. Jesus, we know, does not need anything, especially now that he's in heaven. But his people, who are still here, need that ministry. And in ministering to his body, you are ministering to him. Now, let's not forget as well the other part of it, which is if we withhold, if we withdraw, and we are exhorted many times in Scripture of the fact that that is antithetical to being a Christian. You see your brother and sister in need, and you say to them, be warm and be filled, go in peace, but you don't give them anything that they need to meet that need. How does the love of Christ dwell in you? What good have you done to them? I mean, well-wishing is, is, is good, but if it's not followed up by works, it's, it's not enough. We need to minister to him. So... Likewise, whatever you don't do for one another when you see those needs and withdraw, either in meeting physical needs or spiritual needs, you are not doing those things to him. And we see from the sheep and goat judgment, if that's the pattern of your life, you still need to be converted. You still need to come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because if you have the love of God in you, it's going to move you to meet the needs of those whom you love. I mean, how can you look at somebody you love who's suffering and not do something about it? So let's be encouraged by this, first of all, to love and to serve one another because by doing so, we are ministering to the Savior, and that doesn't mean just those of us who are gathered here, but it means anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, any Christian. Now, the second point is, is this, that ministering to the body of Christ, ministering to Jesus is 
is basically more important. I'm not saying that the other isn't. This is more important than ministering to those outside the body. I think oftentimes we see it going the other way. We got to, you know, let's not worry about what's going on here and the needs here. Let's just get out there and, and do what we need to out there to minister the gospel. The Bible says that there's actually a hierarchy when it comes to ministry and that the Lord would have you to minister first to his body before ministering to those outside the church if there are needs within the congregation. Now, when the disciples complained that the ointment could have been sold and the proceeds given to the poor, Jesus replied, you, you always have the poor with you. But whenever, and whenever you wish, you can do good to them, but you do not always have me. Now, it is true that Jesus, this was a very special circumstance, and that Jesus was only going to be there for a short time, and they didn't have much of an opportunity to minister to him because after he died and rose again, basically, they, they, they couldn't minister to him directly any longer. He didn't really need it. And I'm not saying by this, of course, that the Lord is telling us not to minister to people outside the church. We do need to get the gospel out to them, that they might be saved because Jesus commands us to do that, and he also wants us to be concerned for their physical needs and not just the needs of the body, as the uh, parable of the Good Samaritan often reminds us and even reproves us every time we read it. But Scripture does indicate that our first responsibility is toward the body of Christ in much the same way as, as their responsibility was to minister to Jesus in his last days before his sacrifice. In, in some ways, to give him the strength that he needs to be able to go through it. We are to be more concerned about those within the church. Paul writes to the Galatians in Galatians 6.10. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. Now, we've already seen from the sheep and goat judgment, and we see it in other parts of Scripture as well, that this care for the body of Christ is actually the evidence that we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you another example of that in 1 John 3, verses 14 through 20. If you haven't read 1 John in a while, you'll find it to be very convicting. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. We will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our heart before him in whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. Now, on the basis of that passage alone, is it any wonder why on the day of judgment, the thing that we will be judged for is how we loved or didn't love the brethren? This is the evidence that we are converted, is that we love the body of Christ. So before we set out to help those who are outside the church, we do need to make sure that we have ministered to the church first, that we have ministered to Christ, that we're providing for those who are His. And we do that, of course, again, by ministering to the body. Before we use our gifts and resources to minister to those who aren't a part of the body. Now let me just mention... This is one of, the very, one of the many reasons why the Lord calls us to be members of a local body and to meet together so that we might minister our gifts and our resources to the needs that are inside the body of Christ. You know, I don't know how many people over the years have, have come looking for diaconal help who say they're Christians, 
I'm not sure how many people have actually ever told me the truth over those years, but I often hear them telling me that they're Christians. And I say, well, where do you go to church? And what church are you a part of? What church are you a member of? And usually you all hear this, well, I'm not a member of church. I'm not attending right now. Well, if you were, you would have a body that cared about you and that would meet those needs because that's what our Lord calls us to do. We also need to realize this, that in doing what our Lord is actually calling us to do here, in focusing on the body first before we focus on the needs outside the church, we're actually equipping one another to be able to do what it is the Lord has called us to do as the church, which is to reach out to those all around us. If, if we're in want, if we're in need, if we're crippled, if we're injured, if we're suffering, we're not going to be able to do what the Lord calls us to do out there. We're not. We need to make sure that we are ministered to, that we are healthy. And I'm not saying that we spend the rest of our lives trying to get up to that, you know, get up to speed or get up to good enough health to do these things. But if we do see needs in the congregation, we do need to meet those needs. We do need to encourage one another. We do need to help one another become what the Lord calls us to become so that we can, in that strength, minister to those who are outside the church and reach out to the lost in order that they might be saved. So we can minister to Jesus Christ by ministering to his body. And the Lord tells us that we need to do that before we seek to reach out to the lost. We need to make sure our in-house needs are met. But finally, if you will do this, Jesus promises to reward you for it. He said to this woman, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what she has done will be spoken of in memory of her. Again, that's why we're reading about it this morning. There is a reward for ministering in-house as well as out of the house, as it were. Listen to what the author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 6.10. For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name in, minister, in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. Notice again, all these, all these exhortations to minister in-house, to minister to the body, to minister to Jesus Christ, it is essential before we'll be able to reach those that are out there. But notice what he says is this. The Lord is going to note, he is going to remember every act of kindness, every gracious thing that you do for his people. Because, again, what you are doing to one another, you are doing to him. And he is going to reward you for it. Now, maybe he'll have what you do written down in the history books so that future generations of Christians will be able to read what you've done and be encouraged by your example to do the same thing. He did that with Wycliffe and Huss, Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, and a host of others. Not everybody makes it into the history books, though. So maybe he'll reward you with greater resources so that you'll be able to continue to minister more and more to him and to others. But we do know this. He certainly will record what you have done. He talks about in Micah, or excuse me, Malachi 3.16, his book of remembrance. The Lord doesn't need a book to remind him what we've done. He even knows what we're going to do before he ever created us, the world, and everything else. He knows absolutely everything. But he represents himself as one who writes down everything you do. At least if you're a Christian, he writes down all the good things. And if you're not a Christian, he writes down all the bad things. And on the day of judgment, you have to answer for those things. But again, the point here is positive. He writes down the good things. He remembers them. And he says he will reward you for them. Perhaps he will give you greater honor and glory in his kingdom. He does that. There are levels of glory we know in Scripture. The greater our sacrifices, the greater we will be in his kingdom. The more we stoop to serve others, the greater we'll be exalted in his kingdom. Certainly, it will result in greater blessedness. I mean, anyone who's in heaven is going to be happy to be there. But there are levels, degrees, not only of reward, but those degrees of reward mean degrees of blessedness in heaven, perhaps the capacity to enjoy heaven as Edwards and the Puritans believe. Now, you know that the Lord is no man's debtor, 
whatever you sow, you are going to reap. And as you sow in this way, you will reap in this way. So as you think about how you might use your time and how you might use your talents, your gifts, your resources, don't forget the words of Jesus. Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Let's not forget that Jesus can be ministered to. And whatever you give to him, he is going to give back to you in ways that are going to be glorious. And don't forget as well that you can only minister to Jesus Christ if you belong to Jesus Christ. If you don't, you first have to trust him. You have to love him and follow him and serve him. And then as you're able to do that by his grace, you will be able to minister to him, to his people as he calls you to. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to take the things that we've seen this morning and really to apply them to our lives, to give us the grace to remember them and, and to put them into practice. This, as you can see, is extremely important. Everything he says is, but I think this in particular. So let's pray that God will help us to do that silently for a few moments.